My name is Chris Kozik, and I am the co-principal investigator for the ADES project at Springfield Technical Community College. The ADES project is funded through the National Science Foundation's Research and Disabilities Education Program. The primary goal of the ADES project is to create and test a replicable model of a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics college success program for returning combat veterans with disabilities. The ADES project creates a model that utilizes wraparound interventions surrounding veteran students with a welcoming environment, supportive faculty, intensive pre-enrollment preparation, ongoing academic support through tutoring, mentoring, and advising, and networking opportunities with other veterans. An objective of the grant is also to train STEM faculty in the principles of universal design for learning. The following presentation by Dr. Don Tamarkin, Professor of Biological Sciences at Springfield Technical Community College, was delivered in May 2010 to faculty interested in incorporating universal design principles in their classes. So I'm going to give you some background on UDL. I wanted to go through some goals uh, for the presentation today. And um, the first goal is to just introduce you to Universal Design for Learning. Um, I want you to learn how to evaluate your specific course for the UDL opportunities that you can provide. I want you to, to uh, come up with your own ideas for things that work for you. You know, there isn't a one style fits all method in teaching. We all know that. So I'm going to show you a lot of specific examples of things that I've done that are UDL. And it's not because I think that you should do those same things, even if you t teach biology. It's because um, there are things that work for me, and I can show you how they work for me. And you'll need to come up with some of your own methods. So I certainly don't expect everything to just jump into your, into your classroom directly from mine. Um, <clears throat> another thing is that you should be able to then come up with what is the pertinent por portion of your course that needs the redesign. So the idea is don't waste your time coming up with fancy methods for something that's obvious and clear. Figure out how you can focus in on the things that need the most work. What are the things that the students struggle with the most? <clears throat> I want you to see some examples of my stuff and I want you to get excited about UDL for your own course. This is my own um, list. So that universal design for learning is a way to be more inclusive in your classroom. Everyone's on equal footing. It's a way to reach more of your students. Um, it's very helpful in figuring out where you spend your time and effort in your course so you don't waste your time. And it's not just better for students with disabilities, it's better for everybody. So um, one of the unfortunate things about universal design for learning is that it seems that the only people that really get involved with it are people that work in disability services. But that's not the idea of universal, right? The people with dis students with disabilities uh, aren't the majority of our classes, and yet the majority of our class is served by UDL. So a little bit of background, just a tiny bit. Um, UDL, Universal Design for Learning, came out of UD, which is just universal design. Um, some classic examples of this of, of universal design, but not for learning, are the curb cut. So when you get to the corner, the curb is cut down so you can roll a wheelchair or a walker right into the street. Um, a couple others that are pretty obvious are those bathroom stalls that have that are for the, their wheelchair accessible. So disability uh -huh. sinks, they have the big handles. So you don't have to do these little things with the faucet. So another example that I got off of a website that I give you at the end is um, closed captioning on TV. Supposedly, closed captioning on TV, it's not just for people with impairments, um, but we all know that you, if you're at the gym, you can watch the closed captioning. And supposedly, the number one use for closed captioning is couples at night. When one member of the couple goes to sleep and the other one wants to keep watching TV, UDL um, brings universal design now into the classroom. So we take these concepts of take something and figure out how you make it for someone with a particular need, and we take it from just structural and physical, we take it into learning for UDL. Now you can determine what you need to change in your class to reach more of your students. 
Um, st and students actually recognize your efforts. They know you're doing something for them. They appreciate it. It's a very different classroom environment. Um, and I will say that this has been one of the hugest things for me, that they recognize my effort. Also, you, can, you don't have to start and change everything in your class. Um, you can start with something small, make very small changes, and just slowly add more and more. I really think it's not just another like, educational method. It coordinates all the others. It's a broader way of thinking, and other methods are much more specific. Even though active learning is open, it really is a big open category. You can do a lot of things that are active. It's still not necessarily the same thing as universal design. And universal design can include constructivist, cooperative, active, inquiry-based, all those other things. Um, <clears throat> but it's not limited. This is from CAST. Uh, the CAST website is uh, a really good one for getting information on um, UDL. And if we have time, I'll try to show it to you. They, have th they say that there's three things involved in UDL. But they say that there's three main areas that UDL involves. One thing is multiple means of representation. So they say that diverse learners need options for acquiring information and knowledge. So we have to give different representation of information to our student. Multiple means of assessment, because um, students don't all do the, the same on different styles of assessments. And multiple means of engagement. Right, so different ways that they could get involved in the course. All right, we all know we get an accommodation sheet for our students at the start of a semester. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to do certain things for your student. And sometimes your student wants you to, and sometimes they don't. Um, but they, they might not be the best thing for the student, the accommodation that's required by law. All right, they, so for example, an example of an accommodation is to allow a student with physical or visual disabilities exemption from microscope work. So if they can't look in the microscope because of physical reasons or visual reasons, you can say, well, you don't have to do the microscope unit. That is a legal accommodation. But now, that student doesn't have the same information. They're not getting what everyone else is getting. And so is it really an appropriate accommodation for your course? Another thing is some of the reasons that students don't do their accommodation is sometimes they can feel really singled out. So if you can do UDL in a way that doesn't, so that includes all your students and doesn't necessarily single out somebody, that's terrific. Um, UDL approaches enable you to teach the same material to all your students. And you want to keep thinking about that, or almost all your students. It's a, a broader group. So I'm going to show you the way that, that works for me to think about UDL and how to put it into my classroom. And um, I think it's easiest to pick apart a different, different aspects of my class to look at how my class is set up. So I've got a worksheet for it that I've given you. And I did already tell you that another teacher liked those three um, approaches from the CAST website. And we can come back to that if, we, if you need to, the multiple means of representation, assessment, and engagement. Um, for anyway, for, um, for my purposes, I need really practical approaches So instead of theoretical. So, um, I've also come up with a worksheet only using some of the types of diversity, but you can think about all the others as well. And so it could be a much more complex worksheet, but I wanted to make it simple for a start. Um, so if you take out the worksheet that looks like this, uh, worksheet to redesign your course using UDL, when I said that, like the practical aspects of a course, I thought about, OK, what do students do? And this would be what the students do. What do I do, how I present? Um, what's my content that could be tricky? And then how do I do assessment? So the first thing to think about is what students do. And this could be in a lecture room or in a lab room. So there might be tasks or things that students do that require their physical movement or their dexterity. So that's just to think about what do they do and if they have a physical disability or motor disability, how would, could they be limited? All right. Which tasks require visual observance? So think about all the things that, you, that your students do in the room 
that if they don't see it, they can't do it. Um, how about just listening or conversation? So now if there's somebody with an auditory um, processing problem or uh, just an auditory disability in general, which things would they be limited in in your class? And that could be a group work thing. Um, which tasks require a specific sequence of steps? So sometimes they have to do things, first do this, then do that, then do this, then do that, then do this, then do that. Now you have a student with a learning disability, they're like, what? What's next? What do I do next? Um, so when you think about what you have going on in your class, uh, what I'd like you to fill in on the line is when your students are doing all these things, think about your class, which of these things could they not do? Another thing is that we often, when we think about what, what students have to do, we think, well, they should be able to do it. I'm not going to give them all this extra stuff because it's like holding their hand, you know? We're just, that's overkill. Some students can't proceed without it, though. If, I think everybody would do better with it in, in general anyway, so y you can give it to them and not worry that you're really force-feeding. So this is for what they do. So just take a second and think about anything in your class that your students do, whether it's all of the specific sequence of steps they have to run through, or if they have to do something that's really just listening, like not with their hands or anything, if they have to do something that they have to see, mm -hmm. okay, if they can't see it, they can't do it. Um, and this isn't even just for students with, specifically with a visual disability, you know, you get that student who really wants to sit in the back, but when they're in the back they can't see. What does that say? What is, what'd you just write? Well, it's this big, you know, it's like three inches tall on the board. You should be able to see it. But they want to sit in the back, but they can't see the board if they sit in the back. Now think about what you do. Okay, do you mostly just draw on the board? Um, so if you have a board, do you use it all the time? Do you mostly just talk? That's what I'm doing today. Do you move around? Do you have students move around? Like, is it moving around a big part of your, of your class? Um, do you have students working in groups? Do you give applications for your material? Now sometimes in anatomy and physiology, for example, an application seems easy because you've got this health application that they can understand someone's sick or they've got a disease or whatever it is. But sometimes it's not so easy to understand and even when it is a disease, sometimes it's hard for students. Um, so I want you to think about applications. Now another thing about this is it might seem like it'd be really easy because if you want to change any of these, um, but it's really the hardest thing because we get into a rut. We have our classroom a certain way. We have a certain style. We do it every day. Every time you change what you do, it's hard. Um, so this is really, I think, the hardest thing to change in your classroom is to change what you do. Now, as far as um, moving around, I had a student, um, not this past fall, but the fall before, who had PTSD from, uh, he was a veteran. And he needed to sit in a spot in the room where he could see all the exits. Mm -hmm. um, and if I walked over to him, he, he warned me. He said, don't just surprise me. Don't just like walk over. And a couple times I'm starting to walk over and I, I would make sure that he could hear my voice so he knew I was coming. Because I didn't want that, I didn't want to see what he would do when he was surprised. Because he was tough, okay? <laughs> so you don't want to surprise him. And moving around really freaked him out. Um, which topics are really complicated? So there's all these levels. It's tiered. It's hierarchical. Okay, multi-level. There are some concepts that are strictly visual, especially in biology or in sciences and in math, too. There can be things that just seem really visual. Um, there's also, sometimes you give your students information from a whole bunch of sources. And if you give them a picture of the same thing from here and there and here and there and here and there, some people love it and some people it overwhelms them. Okay. Um, also, there are some, there's some information that has multiple thought steps. So if you can guide them through questions that are open-ended still but help them focus, then they'll, they'll probably succeed. But it's new for them, all this material. So without the guidance, some students can't get there. You have to consider a variety of variables and which variables are at work in which situation. And based on which variables are there, you get a certain outcome. So for assessments, um, do you have multiple methods for student expression? There are a lot of different assessment 
um, strategies to make an assessment more UDL. And I'll give you some things that I've done, um, but uh, you, you kind of know if you have a student that just can't do certain certain things and you can give them multiple opportunities like I will give them a take-home um, and the take-home yeah they can use their book yeah they can talk to each other I don't mind because what are they doing they're working on the material I want you to use the worksheet and choose one or two areas that stand out as target areas for redesign so Anything that could be problematic for certain students that you either do, they do, your content, or maybe your assessment. And just start to list what the key ideas are or goals of each of these target areas are. So um, what I put on here is that sometimes we're so used to doing something one way that we don't consider other ways. And to do that, we have to more fully define the goals of that lesson. I'll go through a few of the things I've done, and these are some a visual task redesign, motor skill redesigns, a few of them, um, a concept redesign, and then a whole bunch of others that I've thrown in there, and a couple I've forgotten that I brought anyway with me today. And I'll start with the cell, with the visual task redesign and the cell models. So, um, when I thought about what I was doing in my class that might not be inclusive. Um, I happen to also have, at the time, a legally blind student in my class. Uh, she could see a bit, but uh, legally blind. So she couldn't see in the microscope, and I knew that. So the issue was that students use microscopes to view cells, and anyone who has a visual impairment can't benefit from this work. But in addition, you know, from the microscope work, but in addition, you know, when we're done with the lab and we're cleaning up and everyone's leaving and they get their books together and they're walking out, they all start talking to each other and you hear them say things. And I've heard them as they leave my lab saying, now this is after I spent two hours working with them, saying, I don't know what I just saw. Do you know what you just saw? No, I know an idea what I just saw. <laughs> so you feel like, okay, there's something missing. And it's not just my students who can't see in the microscope, okay? It's, it's everybody. So in trying to think about what were my goals for all this microscope work, I came up with just a couple of general goals. So like, why do we look at all these cells in the microscope? And <clears throat> one idea is that each, we look at a different uh, varieties of cells, cell types. And each type of cell can be distinguished based on what type it is and the visible components within it. And that if you can see these certain components, you can recognize them and relate whatever components are there to what the cell does. Using a microscope as a tool as a tool is something that is new to them. Whenever you have a new tool, it takes time to get used to it. So I try to um, think about how can we do this with, um, without necessarily just having the microscope. What alternative presentation can I give? This is a picture of a, sm a small portion of a field of cells from a green plant called Elodea. And if you were the student, and this is just a visual slide, would you know what to draw? Would you know what a cell was? Mm -hmm. What thing are you supposed to be looking at? So we often get students who instead of drawing one cell, they'll draw the whole field. It's a circular field, so they figure the circle of everything they can see is the cell. So or they'll find one tiny little dot in here. That's the cell, that must be the cell. So they don't know what a cell is. And they have no idea what to draw, which even if they're not an artist, that doesn't matter how well they draw it, it's just that they figured out what a cell is. They, they can't do that, they, they don't know what they look at. And they walk out of the room going, I don't know what I saw. Everything looked the same to me. What I came up with were some cell models. Now I'll start with my final one. These are the new ones that I just finished. If you take one of the membranes, okay, and you say to the student, this is the membrane for the cell, and I want you to, I want you to act like the cytoskeleton. I have to throw that in for the biology teachers. But I want you to shape this into the shape of that cell that, that you're seeing. 
Now they have to figure out what shape they turn it into. This is my cell shape. Someone else will say, my cell doesn't look like that. And they look in each other's scopes until they figure out, by doing that, they'll know what a cell is. Now, someone with a visual impairment who can't look in the scopes, if I put it down, mm -hmm. they can at least feel what the shape is for that cell. And then you can shape it into another cell. So because it's a plant cell, although it's hard to see in this picture, so now you can take the cell wall and put this on the cell. Now, one of the problems that all students tend to have is which is the cell wall and which is the cell membrane. And when you arrange these, they only fit one way, and that is with the cell wall on the outside. The cell wall won't fit on the inside. And you can take these green things and start to stick them in. And they don't even necessarily know what they are, but they know that if they're only given certain things, that the green things go here, right? Now they can start laying in all these green things, and they'll put them wherever they would be in the cell. And what's really fun about this cell is that the green things move. So they're not in one spot for very long. But they'll, so they'll put it in, and if they start moving, they have to, keep, they have to move them around. So next thing you know, they're, they're quickly trying to move them. Like, and now there's all this other stuff happening in the cells. And with the students and with the groups. So you know, anyone who can't see can still see what they're seeing by feeling this stuff. And so I've added a lot of tactile components to this. Um, and I've also added some other concepts too. So for example, you can take two halves and put them together. Mm -hmm. So they realize that they're only looking at a half or when it's open, but they can see what the hole would be like moving around or they can feel the hole. So there's a lot of other things you can do with it. But when students are doing it with the cell models, they actually can draw the cell that they're seeing. They know what to draw now. If nothing else, they can draw what's on the table. Now, when I do testing, when I assess, so in lab, for a lab practical, I stick some models on the lab practical. And I say, what kind of cell is this? What does it do? Oh, this makes sugar, right? Because it's got chloroplasts in it. But kind of step through, and I make sure I assess them the way that they're learning as well. So I give them both. So, and you can, on this uh, purple onion cell, you can see how thick the cell walls are in this picture, how there's all this space between the two. And there's some things they're limited with, and the models are limited, and then they start to ask questions. They'll say, well, this is a thicker cell wall. How do we show that with this? You can't. But just because they ask the question means they're seeing it. So they suddenly start to express themselves more. They have the models, so now they, t they say out loud the word chloroplast. They say out loud the word cell membrane, and they say it differently, separately from cell wall, which normally they put the two together. They'll start to talk about it. They'll be using the words that you want them to learn. So any kind of manipulative can be very handy. What I've tried to do is come up with some general, quick, how is this universal? But there's a lot of things that are universal about something like this. Um, so for each of my redesigns, I've tried to give a little slide on how is it like a universal design. In this case, all students will see the small subset of visible components that make up a cell. You, know, you just lay out all the components on a cart or whatever. They all know what to draw now. So they have some idea. And they'll look in each other's scopes to verify that that cell that they see on the table in the models is the one that they're drawing from the, it's the one in the microscope. Um, if you're a tactile learner, an interactive learner, a kinesthetic learner, you can learn better. Um, you also, there's something to be said about modeling the actual cell that you see and not modeling some typical generalized cell. Textbooks always have pictures of a generalized and or model animal cell or model plant cell, and nothing looks like that. They start to make critical evaluations, like, my cell doesn't look like that, or the cell wall is thicker, or um, wait, how come the cell, mem the cell membrane is yellow and some of the other organelles, why are they yellow? And they start to talk about, oh, because it's made up of lipid. I knew that students who had visual disabilities couldn't see in the microscope. I mean, that's a given. But in order to do the cell models, what I had to do is reevaluate my goals. So again, you have to think about what, what are your goals in that lesson? What do they need to know? 
So I came, I put down here three issues that had to do with motor skill redesign. So three motor issues that I came up with that when I'm thinking about what can students do or not do is one is um, note taking. How do they deal with note taking? Um, another is um, they might not be able to get the microscopes out of the cabinets. Students in a wheelchair also might not fit under the lab bench. Note taking. You know, I always figured students get note, can get notes from each other. And I thought that, you know, if you really needed a note taker, you'd get one from disability services. There are a few problems with this. One is the students are embarrassed about their notes. They don't like to share them. So I wanted to come up with some alternative and, uh, for note taking. So when I thought about my goals, what are my goals for note taking? One is for me to be able to provide a good representation of the notes for each class to the students to give my drawings. I do a lot of drawings. And students, when they do note taking, even if I tell them that their drawing has to take up at least a quarter of every page at each drawing, you get these tiny little drawings. Um, I wanted to be able to get the notes to the students, and I wanted to give them more confidence. So there's two solutions. And one is Mimeo. So I'm going to show you Mimeo, which is why I have this thing recording. Um, it records everything you write on the board. You can also record your voice with the notes. It can be enlarged on the screen so someone who needs to see it in a bigger print, they can. Um, and it turns out that when I give all these notes, it's the committed students who are the ones that use it. It's a little device that, that um, fits on the board. So um, it's, what is this, like two feet, a two foot by two inch device that okay. runs up and down on the board. I can erase the whole board. You might hear the speakers on a little bit. She talks when I push the button. She'll say new page. Or... So now if I want to draw something, if I want to draw a cell, I could draw the outline of a cell and hit tag page. Now you don't see what happens yet, but it made a copy of just the blank. Now I've got a blank for students to fill out. And I could put in the nucleus with its double membrane and nuclear pores. And I can put in DNA. And they have a nucleolus. And then I can start labeling. But if I tag the page again before I label, then all my labels will be on a different slide. And they could try to label at home. So I can say here, this is the nuclear, is that pen working? Envelope. And I can say here, nucleolus, not an organelle because they all think it's an organelle. And I can put over here chromatin and start to define what they would see inside. Now, later when they take a look at this Mimeo file, Mimeo is a program you can get for your computer, and it's free. You do have to register, but they never spam you, and it doesn't mess up your computer. Um, if I go to take a look at it, I can hit the play mode and rewind to the beginning, and I can play it, and it writes everything back in the sequence that I did it, um, so they can see what I did and when, and they can also um, zoom in on it. I didn't show you that yet, but it, they can zoom in on it. Now, in addition, I can have it show in the multi-page form, and each time I pressed a button on there, it saved the screen, so they could print out each of these files separately, and they could annotate it, or they could just print the one that they want. Maybe they only want the summary one that's all done. That's fine. And they can print it in color. So they have all the same colors that I had on the board in class, and it's at least a quarter of the size of the page. You know, so at least they'll be able to see what it was later. Uh, another thing that you can do when you print these out is we have in Disability yeah. Services, we have um, a machine that does raised letter drawings. So uh, if you're doing drawings and you have a student, if you have the raised letter drawings, then what you can do is you get it printed. It's like a copy machine, but everywhere you have ink or some kind of density of color, it takes more heat, so it raises. How is it universal? Well, we've kind of talked about it. They can all access it. They can verify the accuracy of their own notes. Uh, they can catch up if they haven't been there. Um, there are students who don't like to draw anything because they say they're not artists. and they can print out what I did, although I like them to draw it anyway. I don't care if it looks good. Um, 
so they can work on them later. <clears throat> so they like, they like to see how everybody else takes notes. They gain confidence because now they've sent theirs out. They know everybody has to. And they've seen crappy ones, so they know theirs aren't so bad, right? Um, and if they don't normally contribute, they can. Uh, the first motor one was note taking. Here's a different one, which is in the lab. Um, sometimes we have a, students who needs help, a student who needs help in the lab. Maybe it's like a physical dexterity issue. The problem is, is that when you have a room full of students, okay, when you have 24 students or 16 students, depending on whatever the class is, in your lab who are all needing your help, how can you possibly help the one or two students that need extra help? So we've often expected that their lab partner would help them, but we're usually in just single pairs. And then the lab partner has this huge onus on them. Um, and also, if, if the teacher's the one helping this one student, that one student gets really singled out. We needed to come up with some goals, which is make sure that every student can accomplish the lab projects. Um, minimize your extra attention that you give to that student, but also um, don't put too much of a burden on just one or two students, or just one student. Uh, and then maintain availability of the teacher to the rest of the class. So what we ended up doing is, um, when we had a class with a student like this, instead of letting them get in twos, we always, I always had them get in threes. Now, if every group is a group of three, they don't realize that the, it's not like the only group of three is the one with the student with the disability. Mm -hmm. So the lab partners can be assistants to each other. We can still, as faculty, help when needed, but now we don't have to spend an inordinate amount of time with one student. Um, and because the, they work with um, their lab partners, they feel like everybody else in the classroom, and there's two students sharing the burden, so nobody feels like there's actually a burden. So how is it universal? Everyone's equivalent. Students without disabilities don't have to have the professor there all the time. You know, if you've got one lab partner and that lab partner needs assistance, well, then you're also working with the professor. They hate that. So you get rid of that. You, and you end up with normal camaraderie, like a normal community in your class. The multi-step concept redesign. So here's the issue. If there's a complicated concept or if it's really multi-step, it can be more challenging to master. And we tend to know what those things are because they don't do as well on the test. They don't do as well on the test from these things. Um, so students with disabilities will tend to find them the hardest, especially if it's a learning disability. Sometimes a student with a learning disability cannot make it through all the steps. And they need some guidance to get through. Um, I don't always give alternative methods for learning these concepts, because frankly, a lot of things in biology are complex, multi-step, abstract concepts. In the past, I always expect students to figure out their own approaches, and they rarely do. Um, one of my goals is if there's something that's challenging that I could give step by step, and sometimes it's hard for me to know what those are, but if there is something that I can figure out that is a step by step thing, I can give them a guide. Um, it could be a worksheet. It could be just a simple handout. This is what it is. It could even be something that they develop together, and I can explain that after I show you mine. Um, they can do these things alone. They can do them in groups. They can do them at home. You could even just do concept maps yeah. for them. Um, so here's just an example. I had one of our difficult topics in, in biology is transport, how things get across the membrane. And I thought I had taken this really difficult concept and made it pretty simple by just setting up four questions. Um, and if they can answer each question, they'd be able to get through it. But when I set it up as four questions and there's all this text here, Too many words, it's, I know. <laughs> so what I did instead was I turned it into this. There are five methods I want them to focus on. Here are the four questions. They have to, for each thing that might cross the membrane, they have to read the question, say yes or no, and then follow the arrow. So this is just the plan for it. And then there's an application for it where I give them a cell and I show them all the things that could cross. And for each one of these things, they have to read those questions and figure out which of the five ways it moves across. And I list the five ways, although it's small here. Um, and then they just put the number on the arrow. 
And they have a hard time with this because they don't know which arrows to number, if they number everyone. If when they go in opposite directions, they each have to be numbered. But you eventually you can work it through with them. Um, and if they can do this, they tend to do much better on transport. It's now giving them a practical application on top of it. So the concept map plus a practical application. So visual learners would understand this better. Um, students with, dis with, I'm trying to do beyond like learning disabilities. Uh, applications are provided. That helps a lot of students, especially if the topic is really abstract. Um, and again, somebody who has a visual impairment can't necessarily use this worksheet as it is. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that they can't use it with somebody else and work through it. So there's, there might still need to be accommodations. So uh, I wanted to just point out some assessment kinds of things that are not UDL. Um, students with learning disabilities, you give them one of those questions uh, that's a multiple choice where your answer is A, B, C, A, and B, or all of the above. And then they get confused because all of the above is A and B, but it's also A and B and C. And then they just, it's not that they can't think about what's right, it's that now they have to hold on to, okay, this is right and this is right, and it's too many things. Okay, they also have a hard time with which are not one of these, oh, the negatives. Oh. Um, the ones with many thought steps like that example I gave you before. Uh, if you can, so if you could lead them. Some, some easy fixes that I've done um, is, the first thing is this scrap paper idea. So I always tell them when you walk in, first thing you should do is write down what you know on a piece of paper. Once you've got that, what you know, you can just refer to it and you won't get anything wrong because you've already got it written down. So now nothing else will confuse it, nothing else will wind up inside your list that shouldn't be there. And the students that do that usually get a grade higher on every test. Some other little things are to provide those uh, thought steps for them and the other thing that I do is, if I do something in class, if I give them an activity to learn something, if I use the cell models, if I use whatever it is that I use in class, whether it's Mimeo or whatever, I use those on the test too, because they have experience with it. Applications and analogies. Um, biology is very abstract, a lot of what we teach. You know, maybe it's a little bit easier in environmental biology for some of it, because it's stuff you actually touch. Uh, you'd think anatomy and physiology is pretty, uh, it doesn't necessarily be, have to be so abstract, but in fact, we spend most of the time inside of a cell in anatomy and physiology. Um, so the things that they ha don't have a problem with are memorizing bones, but they do have a problem knowing why bones have the structure they have. So all that abstract stuff, they, they struggle with it. Um, and when you have an abstract su subject, if you can give them an application or an analogy, one or the other, it's helpful. So um, computer stuff. The computer stuff is very often universal design for learning. Not always, okay? Because um, computer content is usually accessible and it's something that students can work on on their own. So you give them time, whatever they need. They have whatever environment they need. So it's very user friendly. But there are a lot of, of versions that are not accessible, a lot of items. Um, there are, there are um, screen readers that can be used for some students and it's not just visual impaired, uh, students with visual disabilities, it's also somebody with a learning disability or a language disability to listen to the words. Um, now there's some material that's got limits on accessibility like flash videos. Yeah. Um, you can't do anything with them but listen, or videos that don't have um, closed captioning underneath can be very challenging for some people to, to deal with. A regular HTML page is super user-friendly, right? A Word document, user-friendly. PDFs there can be trouble with for screen readers. There are some challenges with it, but um, for the most part, it's very handy. And so Blackboard, you know, using Blackboard, using all the tools there, using the calendar and keeping them on target. Those kinds of things are very, very helpful and they're universal design for learning. So I do know that my students have benefited, all of them, not just the ones that I've targeted the work for. Um, my classes, my students seem to find it more engaging. At least I get less problems. So if that reflects more engaging, because I can't really speak for the students. 
Um, they actually think that I'm more caring now than I was. Um, so they, get, they take responsibility for their learning. And there are some good websites. CAST has a website that actually has a little tutorial. You can go through a training yourself. And they have videos in it. They're all closed captioned. And they have lots of little things for you to do if you want to go through their training. And this at Washington, University of Washington, they have this site, Do It, that's from Access STEM. And Access STEM is funded by the same program that's funding Chris on this grant, and also me on one of mine, the Research and Disability Education Grant. Access STEM is a, um, but it's the big center. It's like one of the big grants, right? So it's all of the Northwest. It's an alliance. So they used to call them centers. It's an alliance. So, <laughs> so we're this, they're that, right? So anyway, they have a whole bunch of things on the UW site, and um, that could be helpful. So that's all. Thank you.